can you just clarify, just fascinating, uh, the shape of things. So the shape of the Milky Way is of the observable stuff is mostly flat. And then you said dark matter tends to be spherical, but a subset of that might be a flat disk. So you want to hear about the shape of things. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. So structure formed early on, and now our structure that we live in is, so we know about the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. So the Milky Way galaxy has the disk you can see in a dry, dark place. That's where stars and light is. But you can also measure, in some ways, the dark matter. And we believe that dark matter is more or less spherically distributed. Um, and like we said, there's a lot of it. Not necessarily in the disk, but just because it's a sphere, there's a lot of it sitting there. And the reason it doesn't collapse, as far as we know, is that it doesn't really, it can't radiate the same way. So because it can radiate, ordinary matter collapses. And it's actually because of conservation of angular momentum, it, it stays a disk and it doesn't just collapse to the center. So our suggestion was that maybe there are some components of dark matter that also radiate. Like I said, that's far from proven. People have looked for disks. They see some evidence of some disks of certain densities. But I see. these are all questions that are worth asking. Basically, if we can figure it out from existing measurements, why not try? Okay, so there's not all dark matter is made the same. This is well, that's a possibility. Right. We actually don't know what dark matter is in the first place, we don't know what most of it is. We don't know what a fraction is. I mean, it's hard to measure. Why is it hard to measure? For exactly the reason you said earlier, we don't see it. So we want to think of possibilities for what it can be, if especially if those give rise to some of observational consequences. I mean, it's, it's a tough game because it's not something that's just there for the taking. You have to think about what it could be and how you might find it. And the way you detect it is gravitational effects on things we can see. That would be the way you detect the type of dark matter I've been talking about. People have suggestions for other forms of dark matter. They could be particles called axions. They could be other types of particles. And then there are different ways of detecting it. I mean, the most popular candidate for dark matter, probably until pretty recently because they haven't found it, is something called WIMPs, weakly interacting mass of particles. Um, particles that have mass about the same as the Higgs boson mass. Um, and it turns out then you would get about the right density of dark matter. But then people really like that, of course, because it is connected to the standard model, the particles that we know about. And if it's connected to that, we have a better chance of actually seeing it. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's also a better chance that you can rule it out because you can look for it. And so far, no one has found it. We're still looking for it. Is that one of the hopes of the Large Hadron Collider? That was originally one of the hopes of the Large Hadron Collider. I'd say at this point, it would be very unlikely given what they've already accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, but there are these um, underground detectors, xenon detectors that look for dark matter coming in, and they they are going to try to achieve a, a much stronger bound than exists today. Just to uh, take that tangent, looking back now, what's the biggest, to you, insight uh, to humanity that the LHC has been able to provide? It's interesting. It's both... Um, a major victory. Um, the Higgs boson was proposed 50 years ago and it was discovered. The Higgs mechanism seemed to be the only way to explain elementary particle masses and it was right. So on the one hand, it was a major victory. On the other hand, I've been in physics long enough to know it was also a cautionary tale in some sense because um, at the time I started out in physics, we had some proposed something in the United States called the superconducting supercollider. A lot of physicists, I'll say particularly in Europe, but I'd say a lot of physicists were sanguine that the Large Hadron Collider would have the energy reach necessary to discover what underlies the standard model. We don't want to just discover the standard model. We want to know what the next step is. Mm -hmm. And I think here, um, people were more cautious about that. They wanted to have a more comprehensive search that could get to higher energies, um, more events, so that we could, you know, we could really more definitively rule it out. Mm -hmm. But in that case, many people thought they knew what would be there. It happened to be a theory called supersymmetry. So a lot of physicists thought it would be supersymmetry. I mean, it's one of the many factors, I think, that went into the fact that the Large Hadron Collider became the only machine in town. And um, the superconducting supercollider would have just been a much, if it really had achieved what it was supposed to, would have been a much more robust test of, of the space. Mm -hmm. so, so I'd say for humanity, it's both a tribute to 
the ability of discovery and the ability of really believing in things so that you have the confidence to go look for them. But it's also a cautionary tale that you don't want to, you know, assume things before they've been actually found. So you want to do things in, you know, you, you want to believe in your theories, but you also want to question them at the same time in ways that you're more likely to discover the truth. But it's also an illustration of grand engineering efforts that humanity can take on and uh, maybe a lesson that you could go even bigger. <laughs> um, I, I'm really glad you said that though too, because that that's absolutely true. I mean, it's it really is an impressive it's it's impressive in so many ways. It's impressive technologically. It's impressive at an engineering level. It's also impressive that so many countries work together um, to to do this. It wasn't just one country, and how it was. It was also impressive in that it was a long term project that people committed to and made it happen. So it is a demonstration that when people set their minds to things and they commit to it, that they can do something amazing. But also in the United States, uh, maybe a lesson that bureaucracy can slow things down. To what bureaucracy everything... and, and politics. Politics. And economics. Many, many things can make them faster and make them slower. So science is the way to make progress. Politics is the way to slow that progress down. And um, here we well, go. I don't want to overstate that because without politics, the yeah. you know the LHC no, wouldn't happen it. either. So, yeah. um, but <laughs> you need broccoli. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I do think. I mean, you're not asking this question, but sometimes I do think when I you know think about some of these conflicts, you know, sometimes it's just good to have a project that people work on together, and there were some efforts to do that with in science too to have Palestinians and Israelis work together, a project called Sesame. Um, I think it's not a bad idea when you can do that, um, when you can get, you know, uh, sort of for, forget the politics and just focus on some particular project. Sometimes that can work. Some kind of forcing function, some kind of deadline that gets people to sit in a room together. And you're working on a thing, but as part of that, you realize the common humanity that you all have the same concerns, the same hopes, the same fears, the same, that you are all human. And that's an accidental side effect of working together on a thing. I, that's absolutely true. And it's one of the reasons CERN was formed, actually. It was post-World War II, and a lot of European physicists had actually left Europe, and they wanted to see Europeans work together and, and sort of rebuild. And and it worked. I mean, they, they did. And it's true. And I often think that, that, you know, one of the major problems is we just, don't meet enough people so that everyone thinks seems like when they seem like the other, it's more easy to forget their humanity. So I think it it is important to have these connections.